I'm Cheryl Moore. I'm the Director of Research at Wellcome. I'm honored to be here to welcome you to UK Biobank Scientific Conference, though I am really sorry that the UK rail strike has forced us all online. I know that we were all really looking forward to uh, seeing some old friends and meeting some new ones in person, but um, perhaps next time. But there are about 28,000 researchers from 86 countries who benefit from the resources of UK Biobank, many of whom are online, along with others who have an interest in the value of genomic and multidimensional health data to advance understanding about health outcomes and disease. I joined Welcome about a year ago as we kicked off our new strategy, which builds on our long history of supporting basic discovery research and platform technologies, and now adds programs in three specific health challenges, infectious disease, climate and health, and mental health. All the work that we do, and that many of you do, depends on the analysis of robust open data to enable insights into the drivers which affect health. And that's why we're proud to be a founding and continuing funder of UK Biobank. As I think you all know, and as we heard um, in the video, UK Biobank is home to data on a half a million participants who've generously contributed to the creation of scientific knowledge. This has enabled the publication of over 4,600 research studies to date. UK Biobank is one of the largest, most well-characterized data sets globally. Biobank has shown its ability to adapt over time as we build on the available knowledge base. One example of Biobank's nimbleness was the truly impressive way that the team quickly turned their attention to support COVID-19 research in 2020. Within four weeks, over 100,000 Biobank participants and their relatives volunteered to take part in a COVID-specific study. 20,000 offered samples and symptom information and later 785 underwent imaging studies. This work contributed to our understanding of the duration of the antibody response and also showed the correlation of brain tissue damage with COVID among other findings. It's great to see UK Biobank evolve as a resource. We've been excited to see it develop new enhanced capabilities which make it unique and enable researchers to ask important novel questions. And looking to the future is something that we really value at Wellcome. Added, adding imaging studies is one of those enhancements. UK Biobank is working to add additional multimodal imaging assessments like MRI of the brain, heart, and body, carotid ultrasound, and whole body imaging of bones and joints. They're also working on a large scale proteomic study of blood biomarkers, um, results of which just came out this weekend. We at Wellcome are also proud of the long collaborative relationship between UK Biobank and the Wellcome Sanger Institute, as we, together with Decode Genetics, contribute to the generation of whole genome sequences for UK Biobank participants. This is an unprecedented collaboration, bringing together industry, government, and private funding, and makes whole genomes available for the entire cohort, giving us one of the most important openly accessible cohorts worldwide. All of this will help us understand the genetic determinants of disease and accelerate innovative drug discovery. We have ahead of us today some outstanding sessions. I'm eager to hear from the speakers, particularly on how Biobank's data can be made more diverse and can be used more extensively by and for the benefit of diverse populations. We'll hear about recent uses of sequencing data in disease prediction and about new findings in aging, dementia, ocular health environmental exposure on health, and importantly, new uses of genomic data for drug discovery. I'm really excited to hear the latest developments, and I thank the UK Biobank team for bringing us together and for inviting me to join you. I'd now like to turn the program over to the chief executive of UK Biobank since 2005, and one of the key drivers of its success, Sir Rory Collins, to kick off the first section. Thank you very much, Cheryl, and again, an opportunity from the perspective of UK Biobank to thank the Wellcome Trust and the MRC, whose original vision UK Biobank was, um, and who we have been working with together to deliver 
along with funders such as the British Heart Foundation, Cancer Research UK and NIHR. So as Cheryl said, I think we're going to go into a session to talk about um, where we are with the UK Biobank um, and the opportunities for enhancing it in a number of ways, and particularly in this session, to talk about the ways in which we can enhance it by in, uh, encouraging more use of the resource by people around the world, particularly in low and middle income countries and also greater engagement with participants. First off though I'll uh, kick off with um, Professor Naomi Allen who has a cancer epidemiologist and has been the senior epidemiologist for UK Biobank since 2011 and now chief scientist since 2019 uh, who is going to talk about um, UK Biobank up to 2022 uh, and a little bit beyond. Naomi. So Thank you, Rory. So UK Biobank is now arguably the UK's most significant scientific asset and is now recognised around the world as one of the best biomedical resources to perform health related research. So there are four main factors that make the UK Biobank study unique at this particular time. The first, of course, is its size with half a million participants. And we've collected a huge amount of data on each and every one of them, including extensive characterization of participants' genome, lifestyle factors, and also health outcomes. So we've also now have 15 years of complete follow-up of all of our participants through linkage to electronic health records, enabling the identification of thousands of incident cases for research purposes. But perhaps the most important quality about UK Biobank that has really enabled its success is the ease of accessibility to its data, being readily available to researchers worldwide to perform public health research. So over the last year, the team here at UK Biobank have really been focusing on releasing data to researchers and on further enhancing the resource. So this time last year, we introduced new access fees followed a few months later by the launch of the research analysis platform, which will be talked about later in this session, followed by various tranches of release of the whole exome sequencing data. And then in November, the first tranche of whole genome sequencing data for 200,000 individuals. The end of the year saw us reach a milestone of 25,000 registered researchers actively using the resource. And in March, we released our coronavirus antibody status from natural flow test data on over 200,000 participants, enabling researchers to look at the long-term health effects of coronavirus infection. And then most recently, a couple of weeks ago, we released data from polygenic risk scores for common conditions and expanded list of nutrients from the 24-hour web-based questionnaire. And then this week, we're releasing the rest of the whole exome sequence data for the full cohort. In terms of study enhancements, Back in September last year, we completed our coronavirus repeat imaging study on 2,000 individuals, half of whom had been infected with the virus, half of whom had not, to enable researchers to perform really unique research looking at the effect of the virus um, on changes in internal physiology. Following that, we restarted the baseline imaging um, after the a pause from the COVID-19 pandemic with the aim to bring 100,000 participants back for an imaging scan um, due to finish the end of 2024. We then performed a repeat of the cognitive function web-based questionnaire to enable research into the determinants of cognitive decline over time. And then we've also sent out a final blood sample to 20,000 individuals in our COVID serology study for, to enable us to look at antibody persistence follow an infection over a 12 to 18 month period. So these analyses are currently underway and all of these data will be made available as soon as possible. So we currently have over 27,000 researchers, over 3,000 applications from researchers from all over the world. And I know Mahesh and Dan will talk a bit more about this um, in the next come in session. We have over 6,000 publications so far. It's hard to keep up with them. Um, we're covering a vast breadth of research in many different publications. Here I've just, uh, we also have massive increase in citations and patents 
um, really on an exponential scale, uh, particularly over the last few years. I've just here chosen five examples of papers published in the last 12 months to, to really showcase the breadth of research that's been performed from the research. So for example, we've got the use of the whole exome sequencing data identifying rare variants for major depression. Researchers looking at mitochondrial DNA variation in relation to a whole range of phenotypes. Researchers using the brain imaging scans to look at functional connectivity that may mediate childhood trauma and adult cognition. Social science research, researchers looking at isolation and loneliness and how that interacts with genetics uh, to, for the risk of dementia, and also environmental health, health research. In th this particular example, looking at the association of road traffic noise with cardiovascular disease. So over the next five years, we have plans to extend the data that we already have on risk factors and exposures, sample assays, and health outcomes. There are also opportunities to enhance the study even further and to further engage the research community and also our half a million participants that we'll talk more about later in this session. So in order to realize this potential, we recently revamped the membership of our strategic oversight committee and our international scientific advisory board to reflect the diversity needed now in the scientific expertise and the resource, gender and geography in order to ensure that we continue to make this resource as relevant for as many different types of researchers as possible. In terms of the opportunities to expand the exposure data, we're currently exploring the feasibility of establishing new linkages to enable more detailed research into social determinants of health. So we're currently looking at whether we can link to national individual level data on things like education, occupation, tax records, and so on. We also would like to expand our environmental health linkages to enable researchers to estimate lifetime exposure to pollution and other environmental metrics via access to residential history for all participants. There also may be opportunities to perform a repeat assessment on as many participants as possible in order to identify change in exposures. And we'll talk more about that in the session this afternoon. And there may also be opportunities to expand the cohort to first degree relatives of existing participants in order to increase the range of diseases and traits that are representative across adulthood. So for example, enabling researchers to look at mental health and reproductive outcomes in early adulthood and to strengthen research in genetic determinants of disease by obtaining genetic information from family members. There are also opportunities to turn the samples that are currently in the freezer into data that's available for researchers worldwide. So currently we've actually only used about 8% of our participant sample on the biochemistry assays, on performing metabolites for all half a million participants. And we've also performed pilot studies on proteinomics on 57,000 individuals using the OLINK platform. And we're just starting a pilot on transcriptomics um, for single cell RNA sequencing on 5,000 individuals. In particular, the proteomic um, consortium, you can see the, the partners here as continuing momentum with these industry partners who are now thinking of ways to scale this pilot up into larger uh, cohort wide assays over the next few years. So over the next five years or so, there will be opportunities to perform both targeted and untargeted assays of metabolomics, proteomics, and also plans to upscale the transcriptomic work up to about 60,000 individuals for single cell RNA sequencing. And of course, all of these assays are complementary to each other. There are also opportunities to extend the health outcome data. So in addition to our current linkages to death and cancer registries, hospital admissions and for half the cohort primary care data, there are also potential to link to a whole range of disease specific data sets. But of course, this is based on the added value that they bring over and above our existing linkages, the quality of the data, how comprehensive it is, cost effectiveness and feasibility. We also plan to expand our web-based questionnaires. So we're just about to send out a questionnaire on health and well-being with a real focus on long COVID symptoms, followed by sleep disorders, neurodevelopmental disorders. And we also aim to repeat some of our existing questionnaires on cognition, mental health and pain to enable researchers to assess progressive or episodic conditions. 
So finally, there are fantastic opportunities to enhance the resource. And with guidance from you, the research community and our oversight committees, we're here to make the resource as useful as possible for you to produce world-class health research. And I think all of us in the UK Biobank team firmly believe that the best is still to come. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Naomi. And I think the word opportunity was used lots of time there. And I think what we're looking to get out of this conference and beyond is ideas from others as to what could be done to make the resource even more useful for more research. So now um, uh, introduce uh, uh, Mahesh Pancholi, who is our Chief Information Officer. Um, he's responsible for all the data and technology work that under, underpins uh, UK Biobank. He's a former biometrician um, who made the transition to IT early in his career, although he remained uh, specialized in research com computing. Prior to joining UK Biobank, he was worth working in London at a Russell Group University and then um, as the uh, commercial lead in genomics and life sciences research at Amazon Web Services. Uh, so it's a great opportunity to get Mahesh to talk about um, how we're going to move forward in UK Biobank uh, in addressing scientific inequity and enhancing global access using the UK research uh, analysis platform uh, and the Amazon Web Service uh, credits for early career researchers and low and middle income country researchers. So Mahesh, over to you. Thanks, Rory. Um, so yes, uh, as Rory said, I'm Mahesh Pancholi. I'm Chief Information Officer at UK Biobank. Um, UK Biobank was set up with four key principles to make sure that the resource could be used to provide the greatest impact on human health that it has the potential to do. So if you're a bona fide researcher and you're performing health related research that's in the public interest, UK Biobank is available to you. It's available on a non-preferential access model. And what this means is the use of the resources on the same basis for academic or commercial researchers wherever you are in the world. The cost of setting up UK Biobank, building and providing it out as a research resource is covered by our funders. So researchers only have to pay for the services that they use. On top of that, we require that all researchers publish their findings and return the data so that other researchers can use them. This means the whole research community benefits and can build on the work that came before instead of duplicating efforts and funding. On top of all of that, we provide a reduced access fee to student researchers and those from low and middle income countries. And this is the model that UK Biobank have had from the beginning. This model's worked really well for many years um, to the point where, well, the resource got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, providing a democratized global research resource in the age of big data, it brings its own challenges. So first off, we're talking about very large volumes of data. The full UK Biobank data set is over 20 petabytes in size and growing. For researchers to be able to house this, they'd need a lot of data storage infrastructure. And even for those that do have access to this kind of infrastructure, the data transfer time would take really, really a lot of time. Um, time which would be better spent actually doing research. On top of that, when you have this kind of data at scale, the amount of compute needed to perform analyses in a timely manner is it's quite significant. And with significant infrastructure comes the need for a skilled team of people, people who understand everything from the hardware, the networking, right the way through to the scientific questions that you're being asked and how the results that you get might be impacted by the system and the way it's set up. And, the, um, and not to mention that the constant updating and patching to maintain proper security and validity of these systems. Even if you have all of that, we're living at a time when new hardware and new software is being released at a phenomenal rate. And any of these advancements could be the quantum leap to transform your research. And as a researcher, you want the freedom to be able to test these new technologies out and to, to use them as soon as possible. And it's not just technology companies providing these advancements, it's the researchers who are developing and publishing in silico methods. These methods need to be widely shared, they need to be replicated, they need to be validated, and then they need to be built upon. 
So we have come up with the UK Biobank Research Analysis Platform. By providing a cloud-based platform, we're addressing all of the challenges I just described. Now those challenges, they're going to be felt by most researchers, but they would disproportionately impact those at the early stages of their careers, or those from low and middle income countries. The UK Biobank Research Analysis Platform allows the researcher to come to the data so they can get started faster. It provides access to practically limitless, up-to-date compute capabilities when the researcher needs it, and the ability to shut it down to zero when they don't. <clears throat> We launched the platform, which is provided by DNA Nexus on Amazon Web Services in November last year. And since then, we have almost 2000 researchers, approximately 10% of our active research cohort, um, over 550 research applications active on the platform, which also coincidentally is 10% of our active applications. And that number is growing by 10% month on month. Now, for me, these figures are both impressive and they show that there is a need and an appetite for such a platform. So that's good. We have a platform that any of our researchers can use. But for me, that's not enough. How do we go further in the quest to democratize and expand the use of UK Biobank the world over? So we do this with the generous support of our platform providers, DNA Nexus and AWS. So every researcher who uses the research analysis platform gets £40 in their account to help them explore and familiarise themselves with the environment at no extra cost to their research budget. For early career researchers and those from low and middle income countries, AWS has provided UK Biobank with half a million dollars per year in credits for use on the research analysis platform. These credits are provided to researchers in two different forms. We have a getting started award of a thousand pounds, which allows researchers to pilot their work and their methods, uh, to come up with a proposal for their project and to be able to define accurate costings. They take all of these pieces of information and they use them to then apply for an enhanced award, which takes them further. I'm really proud to say since the beginning of the year, we've awarded over 80,000 pounds of this to the early career and lower middle income researchers from the AWS club. And we encourage you to apply. If you think you fit the criteria, search for UK Biobank Platform Credits Programme and go to our website and put in an application. So I guess the question is, has the work we've done made a difference to the geographical distribution of our research? Well, using Nye's previous graphic, in 2016, use of UK Biobank was close to 50-50 UK versus non-UK researchers. And I'm really pleased to show that this is now 80-20 in favour of international research community. But we're not resting on our laurels. There's still work to be done. Among the things we're doing is we're developing training that can be delivered remotely to raise the tide of capability across the research community, particularly in the use of cloud-based platforms for research, as we believe this is the future. We're also enhancing the functionality of the platform to make sure it meets the needs of a wide range of research disciplines and people at a wide range of um, careers, career stages. But as I'm sure you've noticed, there's still many gray areas on that map and we need to do something to address this. For me, I think we need to help people understand that the data in UK Biobank supports a broad and diverse range of research and that much of the work that can be done on this cohort is applicable and generalizable to contexts other than the UK population. This is demonstrated by the fact that UK Biobank is used by over 25,000 researchers in 86 countries around the world. We know that despite the lower access fee, cost for researchers from low and middle income countries can still be a barrier. Cost in general can impact the resources available to work on data at this scale. And that has a knock-on effect in reducing the skills and experience available in the area too. So we're looking at ways we can further address the access fees and the research credits program should go a long way to providing resource and opportunity to work with UK Biobank. However, these are just the challenges we are aware of. We think the fact that we only have 70 registered researchers across the whole of Africa shows that there's more we need to do, there's more we need to understand. And to that end, UK Biobank will be holding a workshop hosted by the University of Cape Town later this year to understand the challenges faced by researchers in Africa, 
and what support needs to be provided beyond platform access, beyond research credits. So to demonstrate the impact of UK Biobank over the last 10 years, I have some charts here to show the numbers of publications, citations and patents from research performed using UK Biobank. As I said earlier, we're at about 2,000 publications per year from this one research resource, 2,000 publications per year, 6,000 citations per year, and approximately 200 patents per year. To me, this demonstrates that the work performed on UK Biobank spans from the theoretical to the practical for a significant amount of research output globally. In fact, in 2019, the UK Biobank team went on an outreach trip to China. And since that trip, China has grown to become the third largest country by publications on UK Biobank last year, and one of our largest growing countries of use. So we know this works. We're looking to replicate the success in our trip to Africa later this year. So watch this space. So we come to the main question. How do you get started on using UK Biobank? Well, there's loads of different ways to do this. Clearly, our website is a good place to start. You can join the webinars that are run with DNA Nexus or join the community forums. And in all of these places, you can learn about or discuss how you would do your research using UK Biobank. Once you know what you want to do, you should put in an access application. That will help you get approved for use, and then you can get exploring. As I said before, the UK Biobank website has details on all of these things and on how to apply for the research credits program for those who are eligible. And then it's over to you. May you be successful in your research and change the face of human health. So thank you for taking the time to listen to me. A few thanks from me, of course, Firstly, to our 500,000 participants, without whom we wouldn't have a resource, our funders for continuing to support us, and our platform providers, AWS and DNA Nexus, for helping us in our goal to reduce scientific inequity and democratise access to UK Biobank for the good of human health the world over. Thank you. Back to you, Rory. Thanks very much, Mohex. And, uh, and to hand over now to, to Professor Van Stein, first of all, I'd like to thank him for the guidance he's giving us in thinking about how to um, uh, increase use in, um, in Africa. Uh, Dan is a professor and chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Cape Town and director of the South African Medical Research Council's unit on risk and resilience in mental disorders. And uh, his particular area is in uh, anxiety and related disorders, including obsessive compulsive, compulsive spectrum conditions. And I think what makes it very relevant to have him speak now is how much he's contributed in that field via collaboration around Africa, uh, particularly, but globally. Mentorship, which I think is another thing he, I hope you will be talking about, um, as well as, of course, publication. And so um, uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, for agreeing to, to talk and please uh, anyone who's listening uh, please do put questions in the chat so we can um, have a an active um, panel discussion so Dan over to you great thank you so much uh, Rory for the opportunity this is really exciting that the UK Biobank is coming to Africa and I suppose I'll be talking about some considerations about that uh, call reach out so I guess I'll just provide some brief background about the gaps and opportunities, talk about some key issues and one or two recommendations. So it's clear, um, particularly in the genomics area, but really in multiple areas, that uh, there's a need for diversity in our health studies. And with uh, DNA, us all coming really from Africa, us all being Africans from a genetic point of view, um, Africa's of particular interest. But sadly, there's a relative lack of health clinicians and scientists on the continent. Whoops, I think this is, uh, I'm quite finished with that slide, thanks. And um, there's also a relative lack of health and science research. Um, so I think uh, the uh, GBD studies, Global Burden of Dise Disease Studies out of Seattle have been uh, remarkable in giving us uh, specific and rigorous data about things like health life expectancy that what we're having in yellow is, uh, in, in sorry, red, is the growth in demographics in the African continent. And you can see that where other continents are leveling off, uh, we're set to really expand. 
and uh, creating all sorts of issues and challenges that require health solutions. Uh, on the good side, the need for attention to African health is well articulated and there have been some key successes with significant clinical research infrastructure established in parts of the continent and a good deal of capacity building. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so here, for example, on the good side, we can see that there's been a significant improvement in uh, global under five mortality rates. Next slide, please. And another um, inspiring development has been the growth of publications on the continent, uh, really moving up and I think doubling, in fact, in terms of our rep global representativity in terms of the proportion from Africa, although still at a fairly low overall um, number. Next slide, please. A huge boon uh, to the continent's research, and very much in line with UK Biobank, uh, if we can just stick with that slide for a moment, is been the H3 Africa uh, Human Heredity and Health on the continent. This was funded by the Wellcome, also funded by the UK Biobank, as well as by the NIH. And there have been a huge number of workshops uh, in things like bioinformatics, uh, genomic analyses, mentorship of students, uh, publications and the development of an H3A Africa chip, all of which has contributed to the ability perhaps to use the UK Biobank. Next slide. So some key issues, I think, as infrastructure, as Mahesh has already mentioned, mentorship and one or two others. Next slide. So I think there's, as I mentioned briefly, a growing increase uh, of the number of, of clinician scientists uh, who are working in this kind of area. Um, there's also been, uh, partly through H3 Africa, an increase in the number of postgraduate students and postdoctoral fellows. Um, and I think increasingly, there has been development of internet access, internet speed storage facilities, although these are pretty variable throughout the continent and that would need to be taken into account going forward. Next slide, please. One of the things that happened with H3 Africa is that there was a massive number of north-south networks established, as well as south-south um, collaborative opportunities. And this allowed a good deal of mentorship between the north and the south, um, between different countries within the continent. Um, and I think that was really important and led to a significant number of the H3 Africa papers. Still, it remains an ongoing gap, I think, and uh, at the same time, on the flip side, a wonderful opportunity going forward. We've discussed a little bit the applicability of the UK Biobank to African populations. There are, of course, uh, differences in disease profile and genetic profile and environmental uh, factors and so forth and so on. On the other hand, um, it's absolutely clear that working with UK Biobank data is also going to uh, be useful for addressing a number of African health issues. Of course, ultimately, we do need to develop our own African biobanks, and I think uh, collaborating with the North uh, on that would be incredibly useful as we go forward. Um, certainly, just being part of this conference uh, is enormously inspiring. Next slide, please. So, um, I just I'd like just briefly to talk to to these different. Uh, what are the needs and uh, barriers and, and, and availabilities? Uh, a little bit more about net networks and mentorship. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, much as I'm, I'm happy to represent all of the African uh, continent today, I, I clearly what, what, what we need is much more detailed and complex interactions with a range of individuals, um, from a variety of countries and institutions in order to really think down on what are the specific uh, barriers and what are the opportunities? And I think the conference coming up uh, towards the end of the year will allow us to get into the nitty gritty of that. And I'm very much looking forward to it. Next slide, please. For me, H3 Africa, although it's really just one study, was um, particularly large and particularly well supported by Wellcome and the NIH and very useful in exemplifying the value of scientific networks and individual mentorship. Um, and I think much more remains to be done along those lines, building on the successes of H3 Africa, learning from its failures and moving forwards. 
Next slide, please. I think uh, what we are also need to keep a close, eye, uh, close eye on is the opportunity for engaging funders to build and to strengthen uh, African biobanks in the future, uh, including the African Brain Health uh, Genomics Project, uh, the recently launched Nigerian 100K, and others. I think there's enormous opportunity to collaborate with UK Biobank and to further build uh, on the kinds of things we're talking about today. Uh, next slide, please. So I uh, recently asked uh, to head a talk very much along the lines like this with the question, are we out of the starting blocks? And I'd like to argue that we are indeed out of the starting blocks and uh, it's exciting to see what will happen next. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dan. I think that throws up quite a lot of questions to the panel. And again, please do send in your questions um, uh, through uh, through to the team. So, so the final presentation is by Simon Burrell from the charity Involved, which is helping um, uh, UK Biobank to think about how we uh, engage and involve participants to a greater extent in, in UK Biobank. Um, and uh, so he's a senior associate involved with extensive experience in the fields of democratic reform, open government, public participation, stakeholder engagement, and um, has also worked at the local and national level, not just in the UK, but uh, internationally in Africa, Asia, and Europe. Um, and so uh, we had a very interesting session uh, on Friday with Involve, and um, I'm very much looking forward to hearing um, from Simon about uh, how we might deepen UK Biobank participation uh, and engagement by the, the participants. Simon, thank you. Great, thanks, thanks, Rory. Um, so, uh, so, and really, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks very much for inviting me and for for asking us uh, to work with you on thinking about how you deepen engagement for for UK Biobank. So, I'm going to talk briefly about three things. Um, uh, the first is kind of just thinking about how the context has been changing um, for, for UK Biobank and for other cohort studies, and as we think about kind of doing science with different populations, think about the risks of not engaging, um, and then finally. Um, just uh, identify a number of different ways that, that uh, you might begin to think about kind of enhancing your engagement. Um, so the first thing I want to uh, talk about is um, uh, trust, which is a key element of uh, of any context and obviously trust is one of those things that has really begun to um, uh, worry politicians, worry scientists, worry um, a number of other professions um, and I don't know how well you can see this but scientists on the whole in, as you compare trust in scientists to other professions do quite well not as well as nurses and doctors but really quite well and that that trust sitting there kind of at nearly above the 80% um, has been there um, for a number of years so that kind of trust is is upheld up holding which is good obviously but it does hide something else which is that um, trust uh, differs between uh, different groups so here we've got a slide looking at how trust um, across the, all these different professions varies depending on um, levels of education um, and you can see there that the trust declines significantly in scientists um, uh, for those who have lower educational levels and if you begin to think about different demographics whether it would be gender ethnicity uh, location and so on um, you will get see varying uh, varying levels of trust and and that begins to matter when you think about needing a needing a cohort study that has the full diversity of a population um, and if you want their uh, full involvement in the cohort study you will obviously need to understand what's driving trust and, and make sure that you're engaging them in ways that enhances trustworthiness um, so uh, second, and, and that, that trust um, is shown in the UK uh, recently, we've had seen a lot of opt-outs and a significant um, number of opt-outs from, um, uh, from a program to transfer or to, to use uh, GP data. Um, and we've seen as a result of a number of different things, uh, opt-outs rising. Um, and uh, an understanding who's opting out and what that might mean um, for uh, uh, the, the science that we're doing and the data that we're collecting um, is really quite important. It shows how um, even if you still have a significant uh, proportion of a cohort um, enrolled, actually losing 5% of your cohort, and depending on who they are, it might affect the results significantly. Um, 
So it's also important to, to note that, you know, the, we're talking about a longitudinal study that's been around since uh, 2006 and things change. They change for, um, for your uh, participants. Um, you didn't enroll participants when they were babies. You enroll people from 40 upwards, but they, they will change as life changes over those two decades. Uh, their lives have changed significantly. Um, they may have had uh, children. They may have uh, gained uh, new knowledge. Uh, their financial circumstances will have changed. Um, uh, and their health will have changed as well. They will have so they've had significant personal changes, but there've been significant changes uh, in society too. Um, over the over the course of the the life of Biobank, um, we've changed our relationship to different providers. We expect much more up to date information. We expect to be able to find information much more rapidly. Um, our culture is changing. Um, this particular image probably isn't relevant of a punk from the 1970s, but culture is changing rapidly, um, and that that changes is how we relate to each other and relate to those in authority. Um, and then also uh, we've changed the way we talk to each other, we're changing the way we interact with different media and so on. Um, and then finally, um, we've had a number of uh, kind of certainly in the UK since 2016 and then of course COVID for the whole of the world, changing our relationship to those in charge of us, changing our relationship to how we think they should set the rules, what data they should collect on us and so on. But things are also changing scientifically. Um, they're changing in terms of the precision of the types of science we can do. They're changing in the terms of the data that we've got on people. We were talking about whole genome sequencing, which wasn't possible um, as you started. But now um, you've got all of those whole genome sequences that don't just tell you about your participants, but tell you also about those first degree relatives, changing the relationship of participants to the biobank. Um, you've got changes in terms of the data you collect. And uh, Mahesh was talking about the petabytes of data you now have and the sorts of linking you can do to all sorts of different records. Um, and that changes the relationship of participants to uh, the study. Um, and then finally, um, we're increasingly global as a scientific community um, and the sorts of science that's being done in the UK can also be done elsewhere and different uh, legal regimes and so on. And that also changes participants' perspectives of how their um, uh, of how their data might be used and what they think of that. Um, and then finally, uh, me medicine's changing, changing as a result of all those scientific developments. Obviously, we can do all sorts of different scans and find all sorts of things that are wrong with people that we couldn't in the past. Um, we can treat people more accurately in moving into a world of personalized medicine. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, people are living longer with comorbidities um, and so their relationship to their health changes, partly going all the way back to their part, the, the kind of think about the changes for participants, but we're living with more diseases for longer. And that changes our perspectives on how we think about the data that's being collected, the relevance of that data and so on. So things are changing. So of course, our, our relationship with participants um, and those who are operating kind of across all of those domains on that slide also needs to change. Um, so the, the kind of final part of the context I want to talk about that's changed is um, public engagement. The world of public engagement has changed significantly. Um, uh, so here is a graph from the OECD looking at the number of uh, citizens assemblies and deliberative mini publics that have been um, run since the uh, mid 80s. And as you can see, um, increasing numbers of citizens assemblies going on, most obviously in the UK, at least on climate change, but they're happening across all sorts of domains, including in the medical domain. Um, and there are all sorts of new technologies um, uh, and new, new, new types of engagement methodologies that are um, coming into being um, that are allowing different ways of understanding how people think about science, how people think about policy, medicine and so on. Um, so uh, there are a number of risks from not engaging. Uh, I've already talked about participant dropout and what that might mean for the quality of the data that you hold. Um, there are also risks of, well, if we don't really understand what it is that participants in the cohort actually think is relevant, what, that, what they would find useful to them, well, then the public, the, the research that we carry out may be less relevant for them. Um, we have uh, issues of if we're not engaging effectively um, with participants, but also we're not engaging effectively with, with researchers, well, we'll reduce our um, collaboration opportunities. Um, and all of those things risk potentially uh, the reputation because there are lots of cohort studies that are doing all sorts of engagement. And because the context is changing, um, any cohort study needs to stay up um, with, uh, with the best practice in terms of engagement. Um, uh, and then finally, all of those things could 
potentially lead to a funding uh, reduction. So there are definite risks from not engaging. So how might you um, engage? And I've identified five different ways you might engage for this slide here. So um, the first is just how you communicate. You know, what is it that um, your participants actually want to know? Are you providing them information in the right way about the right thing? So you might want to survey them or run focus groups to really understand whether they're getting what they need in ways that make sense for them as regularly or as irregularly as they would like. Um, secondly, or to try and understand a little bit more about why they got involved in the first place, why they're staying involved, why they get involved in some uh, research enhancements, why they take some scans and not others. So you might want to do that through surveys or focus groups again, so you can kind of best understand how to pitch um, uh, your study enhancements. Um, thirdly, uh, on study design, well, you might want to be uh, you, you might be wanting to kind of test questionnaires with with participants again through surveys, focus groups, or doing user experience research, or doing A and B testing to understand kind of what wording of questions or what um, way of kind of sending questionnaires to participants works. Um, and as you begin to combine that with participant motivation, you might begin to kind of think about how you get more engagement with studies. Um, th uh, fourthly, uh, on study enhancements, well actually here you might want to begin to start running citizens juries or beginning uh, creating slightly more longer form engagement, um, more deliberative engagement where you can begin to really understand well what research would be relevant for um, your study participants um, and what might they want to get involved in and how might they want to be more involved. Um, and then fourthly, well, if you're in, if you're worried about trust, well, are there ways that you begin can begin to involve participants in your governance structure? Some of them might have be having participant representatives in your governance structure. That may not be the best way. There are other ways. You might have uh, participant panels where you can run questions that you're running past your governance structures past these panels. You might have shadow committees that are either feeding into or running parallel with your governance committees, um, much like Nice has with a patient panel, for example example, where you can begin to kind of feed in uh, an understanding of how, how participants think about questions into your governance decisions. Um, and then finally, kind of shifting away from that focus on participants and thinking about researchers wanting to kind of develop that more diverse research, again, more socially relevant research, more internationally relevant re research through conferences like this, um, supporting people to ask you questions, engage with what you're doing, running workshops, doing training and so on. Um, so that's a whistle stop tour of some ways you might engage. It's not exhaustive, but it gives you some sense of kind of um, how you might do it. Um, so thank you very much and really looking forward to participating in the rest of the panel. Um, I can't, there we go. Great, thanks. Thank you very much uh, uh, to all speakers. And um, we, we have a number of questions come, come in. Um, uh, before we do that, though, I, I'd quite like to ask, um, Naomi, you talked about the many different kind of linkages that um, could be done in terms of health outcomes. And I wondered whether you might just comment on the linkage that has become possible during COVID on GP data and, and how, how uh, valuable or otherwise that's been um, and how it's been used. Yeah, so um, before the pandemic, uh, we were able to obtain primary care data for about half of the cohort and then we hit a bit of a stumbling block um, due to uh, data controller processes around GPDR and when the pandemic came quite early on there was an obvious need for access to primary care data to enable research into the determinants of COVID-19 so that enabled the Secretary of State to issue a COPE notice to enable the release of primary care data from directly from the system suppliers to UK Biobank. So we were able to release those primary care data to the global research community specifically for the purposes of COVID-19 research. And that has enabled research into the effects of medications, comorbidities, and so on in relation, in relation to COVID-19. Um, the COVID notice expires at the end of this month. Um, and so we're, we're back to where we were unless we can find an alternative route um, in terms of access to primary care data for research purposes. And, and what did the GP data add? So the GP data give you coded diagnostic information, so conditions that participants have had, but also prescriptions, referrals, 
lab test results. They're an absolute mine of information. Um, in, and they go back for many years. For some participants, they go back to the 80s. So they're a, they're a treasure trove of information for, for research purposes. So, so Simon, you, you referred to the, um, uh, the dropouts from all of the withdrawals um, that were initiated following the, the launch of the GP data for planning and research uh, just prior to the pandemic. Um, and I mean, all, that was about transferring the GP data from the control of GPs to the control of the NHS. <clears throat> and as I'm sure you're aware, there is a an engagement and communication um, process ongoing now that um, the government has committed to having completed before it um, uh, tries to do that again. Do you have any kind of thoughts or comments on that? And particularly with respect to UK Biobank, where of course there is consent for um, from the participants for access to their GP data? Um, well, yes, I mean, some, some of the th these things are obviously kind of slightly out of your hands in the sense that they're being uh, run by NHS England and uh, Department of Health, but some of them are probably slightly more in your control. So um, we're not just talking about uh, these things being under the control or kind of participants being able to kind of uh, give consent because uh, GPs themselves are often uh, are the data controllers. So some of the work you may need to do maybe with maybe at that kind of GP level, supporting GPs to understand the value of biobank the sorts of protocols you've got in place to kind of keep data secure and so on um, uh, and potentially also the value uh, that gps might get out of engaging with biobank in terms of the research they may may be interested in supporting um, and being part of so i think there are things that biobank can do to um, to kind of support uh, the access to that data but also to provide support to nhs england in understanding the sorts of things that motivate gps and participants to want to give consent or not um, so yeah i think there are a number of different ways you might do that and reasons for doing it so, so do you think in a sense the gps are also like participants in the uk biobank that we need to um, involve and engage um, I think potentially and you know not least because they may well be able to help you interpret some of those um, kind of at least at the general level at some of those records um, uh, and uh, and they will be there the ones at the at the front line obviously um, and they may well be identifying uh, questions that are not um, uh, not top of mind uh, for other researchers that are accessing um, the data um, so yes definitely um, and GPs um, uh, obviously kind of are also really high up on that trust uh, index too too, so they may also help kind of build and maintain trustworthiness. Dan, thank you very much for outlining both the opportunities and, the, uh, and some of the obstacles. Um, one question that's come in is, um, is it a limitation to, uh, I think I can guess the answer you're going to give, but is it a limitation to look at Africa as a single continent, given it's so diverse in so many aspects? <laughs> yes, well, no prizes for knowing the answer. Um, I mean, we have, as, as uh, the question alludes to, not only the largest range of genomic diversity that there is, um, but also a huge uh, range of socioeconomic and other kinds of diversity. So, yes, I think in a way referring to the African continent sets one up uh, in a way for an oversimplistic, over-reductionistic kind of way of thinking. And we need, do need absolutely to be much more fine-grained uh, about the approach. Um, uh, you had mentioned early on, Rory, that we have a number of users of the UK Biobank from Africa, and I suppose um, it would be useful to get into that in, in a little more detail and figure out which parts of Africa and why and so forth. Thanks. And as a kind of follow-up to your talk, <clears throat> I was very struck by how H3 Africa had been so important in terms of um, building scientific relationships and, and mentoring. Um, do you think there's an opportunity rather than kind of UK Biobank reinventing this of actually working with H3 Africa and, and kind of working together in that respect? Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, I didn't perhaps focus enough on the importance of, of the lowering of fees that you put in place and on the Amazon web services um, that Mahesh has put in place. I mean, I think this is really important. Um, but fees themselves, I think, um, for me, um, are not the only bottleneck. Um, it's, it's really about those first steps of 
of getting involved. And that often does require uh, relationships. Um, and these might be taken a little more for granted in the global north, um, where pipelines of postgraduate students are a, a little thicker and um, there are more people and there's just more opportunity for networking. So I think in a more remote space uh, where there are fewer students and fewer available mentors, those kinds of links are absolutely crucial. And I, um, again, this may not be, uh, you know, I understand that the primary aim here is to increase the use of uh, the biobank, uh, much as was done with the with with China, but I think it's a little different, perhaps, on the African continent. We don't quite have um, the resources that are available in in China, and I, th I think um, we do have, on the other hand, sort of um, a history of in many countries good relationships uh, and growing relationships with various parts of the UK and Europe, and I think um, there's an opportunity to really then think about how the UK could assist and collaborate with Global South in developing uh, new biobanks that are sort of more diverse, and, uh, both in terms of the genomics as well as environmental factors and the disease profiles. And, and, and what did H3 Africa do around the mentorship that, um, that, that made a difference, do you feel, or the, um, if the mentorship side of things? Yeah, well, I think, I think in order to get an H3 Africa grant, you really needed to go in with a network that was kind of part of the criteria. So you needed um, both uh, Global North partners as well as Global South partners. And that was set up in the actual infrastructure of the science. Uh, in putting in through your application, you would have had to say how you would actually meet, what approach you'd take to dispute resolution, who would own the data, what sorts of things would happen in order to encourage the science. And I think, uh, you know, there is a growing literature on the science of mentorship, if you like, the science of global north-south collaboration. I think it's worth keeping an eye on that literature, distilling the best kinds of lessons and putting them in place for the future. Thanks very much. Uh, Mahesh, th there's a question around um, the research analysis platform, and it, it, it may relate to some of the comments you were making about the further development of the platform. but. Um, Someone has asked that uh, they're, they're planning to access the whole genome sequence data on non-European individuals. So following on from, from Dan, uh, to develop an imputation panel to impute our in-house data. I don't think the research analysis platform would, would be helpful. I'm especially interested in downloading the South Southeast Asian WGS data set. Could UK Biobank facilitate this? Yeah, uh, I think that's a good question. And, and as you say, Rory, it speaks to my earlier point we know that there is more we can be doing with the platform and i'm really keen to hear from people about their their perceptions of why the platform might not be useful their experiences of where maybe there are things that we could be doing better i think imputation is a really good example of that um you know we recognize the value of the 200k whole genomes that we have and the, the forthcoming 500k release and um, providing an imputation service within the RAP is something that we have under active consideration. So uh, my, my suggestion would be that, you know, any issues you might be having, please get in touch and, uh, you know, let's work to make sure that the imputation service that, that we put together, or indeed any other development for the RAP, is done in a manner that actually meets the researchers' needs and is for the researchers. So if we need to give specific thought to how an imputation service could uh, have different ethnic data sets being pulled within UK Biobank. I think it's something we'd, we'd be keen to explore. So, so, I mean, maybe it would be helpful if you described, if you like, um, the genesis of the, the DNA Nexus platform, but you kind of where it came from and where you're taking it to, if you like, um, uh, and but where the strengths are and where, the, where you perceive the weaknesses and um, the, the further developments. No, oh, sure, absolutely. I, I mean, you know, the DNA Nexus platform comes from a bioinformatics kind of lineage. Um, predominantly, the applicability of, of large compute infrastructures was leveraged by biologists with, uh, with, with lots of genome sequences coming about and, and the need for, for big compute like that. Um, I think the DNA Nexus platform is really good for that kind of work, but 
we recognize that actually the types of data that we have within UK Biobank are very, they're multimodal, they're multidisciplinary. And actually what we want to facilitate is bringing different types of data together for researchers who aren't necessarily experts in that field to utilize. In order to do that, we need to first expand the tool set to uh, meet the needs of researchers in different areas, like epidemiologists, like those who specialize in, in using imaging data, we need to look at the different disease domains. So if you're a researcher in cardiovascular health, what are the tools that you, that you use? Um, what's the way in which you do your research? And then the next step beyond that is how do we raise the tide on accessibility for the data and tooling that we have? So that if a bioinformatician wants to combine the genomic data with the imaging data, it should be straightforward for them to understand how to do that. If an epidemiologist wants to combine uh, the, the healthcare data with the genomic data and the imaging data, it should be straightforward to do that. And some of that is tooling, but some of that is community as well. So we, we have the research act, uh, analysis platform communities where people can share expertise and experience and, and we hope develop collaborations there. So very solid bioinformatics foundation work to do to kind of expand beyond that into the different domains of data that we have and the different domains of research that, that our researchers do. In terms of downloading data versus not downloading data, um, can you talk about what is downloadable still and, and, and what isn't and perhaps why? Yeah, so uh, our policy is that the whole genome and whole exome data is not downloadable, that is platform only. Whereas everything else uh, that's been generated as, as part of UK Biobank, it continues to be downloadable. The, the rationale behind that, as I said previously, is about the size of the data, the speed at which the tools develop. And so what we want to do is also make sure that those tools and those data are available to the broadest range of researchers. So that's why that data is platform only. Whereas, as I say, the previous data sets that, that had been generated, they can still be downloaded um, uh, through through the normal kind of mechanisms that we've had previously. Thank you. So, so Naomi, a complete shift of direction. Um, uh, a, a question, are there any plans to collect post-mortem brains, um, uh, which would really increase the utility of the data for research into neurodegenerative diseases? Uh, Dan may have some comments on this as well. Um, there seems at present to be no link between UK Biobank and existing brain donation organisations. That's a really good question and it's something we, we, we discussed quite a lot a couple of years ago actually um, about the, the feasibility of being able to link to the UK brain banks and actually the logistics are pretty challenging um, but and it's something that we actually we thought well actually our focus should be on actually linking to primary care data sets and other data sets for a broad range of research purposes first. Uh, we do recognise that being able to link to postmortem brains would be of huge interest, um, but it requires us to be able to the participant spouse or family member to contact us, let us know that the participant has died us be able to then contact the brain bank, it, it needs a lot of coordination in real time. So actually it's logistically very, very difficult, but it's something that we want to keep under active consideration. A any comments, Dan? I know it's kind of off, off the, the South African um, uh, or African uh, agenda, but uh, well, I've got you. Yes, no, absolutely. So only to reiterate what a wonderful opportunity that would be, but also to uh, agree with Naomi that um, the logistics are tricky uh, and at the extent that I would say that this has been one of the biggest gaps uh, in African research. We, we simply don't have um, African uh, postmortem tissue. There are a couple of really small banks. Um, there have been conversations with people like the NIH to try and build uh, bigger postmortem banks uh, in our situation. Um, it's it's we are so far behind in in such a crucially important area so really hope we can overcome these challenges in the future thank you um uh, a, a question about uh, the the comment that was made or the figure that showed uh, an increase in in patents and um uh, i wonder um naomi whether you could comment on 
you know, the patents that have emerged, or if you like, the themes of patents that have emerged as a result of using UK Biobank? Yeah, so the, the number of patents that have, have been approved using UK Biobank data, as my, myself and my has shown, has really increased exponentially, particularly over the last couple of years. Most of these have been due patents for methodology, so for example, for PRS scores and other types of methods, and also some patents for some therapeutics, although that there haven't been as many of those. It's, it's also worth saying that there has been the development of some spin-out companies based on UK Biobank data, so for example, um, genomics companies applying PRS scores uh, for, for translation to the health service, um, and there are also other companies that are particularly using artificial intelligence pipelines to, for example, turn the imaging data into derived phenotypes that have really been able to expand their capability, particularly based on UK Biobank data. Yeah, I mean, the examples I can think of in terms of the, the image analysis are really quite striking. Um, when the imaging study was first being considered by the funders, the, the main concern was, could these data be turned into anything useful at this scale? Um, and I think what's happened is generating the data, generating the problem has uh, created the solution. So um, first with the, the brain image analysis, turning the brain images into derived variables. Um, uh, there's the spin out company AMRA, um, uh, from a Scandinavian university that is now doing the same thing with body imaging and providing really detailed information about um, fat and muscle distribution, um, a perspectum around the, the liver. And I think um, and the, the cardiac imaging has really moved on and in leaps and bounds with the access to very large scale data. The British Heart Foundation funded a project to create a a gold standard set against which um, people could then develop uh, automated algorithms. And I'm aware that uh, one company has now introduced those automated algorithms into clinical practice. So um, we're seeing quite a lot of uh, uh, different uses uh, coming out. In terms of therapeutics, the one I'm most familiar with is one that's come from the exome sequencing data, identifying a target for obesity, um, uh, which is now, uh, um, they're now looking for a, uh, a therapy for that. And interestingly about that project, uh, perhaps going back to the, the value of having biobanks in different populations, is it was identified first in UK Biobank and then supported by analysis in a US cohort and in a Mexican cohort. Um, so I think uh, illustrating the value of having a number of different cohorts in different, different settings. So, so uh, I had a, wanted to, to ask um, Simon if you might kind of go beyond um, the engagement with participants to the idea of the engagement with the researchers um, uh, and um, uh, the involvement of researchers. I think one of the things that we've seen is not just the altruism of the UK Biobank participants, but also the altruism of the UK uh, and international research community in coming up with ideas, putting a huge amount of effort into helping to enhance the resource by proposing additional questions. Naomi mentioned the web questionnaires that increasingly derive from groups with expertise in a particular area coming and saying, we'd like to do this, or the addition of optical coherence tomography and eye imaging from uh, eye specialists. H how do you think we should go about kind of engaging more um, and extending the range of uh, researchers that feel that UK Biobank is, is their resource um, uh, and to help build it? Uh, I guess I've got two two thoughts. Um, one is the best engagement. You're very clear about what the purpose of the engagement is. What is it that you're trying to achieve by engaging the researchers? Because that gives you clarity about why you're doing it, who you should be engaging, and then how you might do it. Um, and I think that the second thing is thinking through 
you know, when, when you want to engage, it takes some of your time and capacity and a bit of money, but it also requires time, capacity and potentially money from researchers to engage with you. So understanding what their incentives and objectives might be from engaging with you so that you can construct the engagement around their needs and help to deliver what they need is, is going to be quite important. So I guess to get the engagement right, right requires those two key components, um, why you want to do it um, and what it, what's in it for the researchers. Um, and then when we're thinking specifically about researchers, particularly from, from Africa, but other low and middle income countries, um, picking up on some of what Dan was talking about, some of the barriers that exist for, for them to engage, some of which will be just as simple as kind of, you know, travel is difficult from some parts of the African continent to other parts of the African continent or to Europe. It's costly, expensive, time consuming, bandwidth can be difficult. So there are some very practical um, uh, barriers, but there may be other barriers as well that you might need to get over. So understanding who you want to engage and what might be getting in the way will also be quite important. Thank you, Simon. Um, uh, the last question I've got here so far is UK Biobank has data from cardiovascular diseases, neuro diseases, but um, any data from lung diseases, uh, Naomi? I mean, do you want to kind of comment on the information that there, there is on lung function, um, whether that's being repeated, but also uh, the value for lung disease? Yeah, sure. So, um, as you say, we've we collected spirometry data uh, from all half million participants at baseline and also during the repeat assessment and the imaging assessment uh, to enable researchers specifically to look at lung function. Um, and because we have access to electronic health records for all participants, uh, death registry, hospital, inpatient admissions and, and for some participants, primary care, that is enabling research into the full range of lung diseases. So for example, we've got 25,000 incident cases of chronic obstru obstructive pulmonary disease. There are at least 75,000 cases of asthma uh, in, in the resource uh, and bronchitis, lung cancer, um, you know, ev every lung related disease that you can think of is represented in UK Biobank through our access to electronic health records. So certainly for those of you who are interested in uh, respiratory epidemiology, um, UK Biobank is, is a very good resource for you to do that research. Thank you very much, Naomi. Thank you to the, the panel um, for your presentations and also for the discussion and everybody for your questions. And so I'll now uh, hand over to um, uh, uh, so many uh, painless from AstraZeneca who's going to introduce the next session on unlocking the potential of genetics in UK Biobank. Thank you very much.